Yeah, Janet looks great. Thank you for the few who have joined early. Everybody's very prompt. I like that. Um, we're just going to wait until 110, 111 to start to wait for everybody to join. But this should be a very good, good talk, and I'm excited for it. Well, we have uh, some time now just for everybody who's watching. The last event of the conference is a Hear Our Voices panel, um, which is an opportunity. It's mostly for parents and professionals to ask questions of other individuals with selective mutism. But for you yourselves, you have selective mutism. You can ask questions of others. And I will put the link here. We have a special link that you can use to click on and submit your question in advance so we'll have them. So I encourage people to click on that link and ask questions of others and maybe your question will get picked for the end of the conference at the Hear Our Voices panel, which is at 3.30. And I will remind people at the next session as well if they have some questions. Hello, everyone. I'm Dr. Elisa Shippon Blum. I am the president and director of the SMART Center. I'm the president of the Selected Mutism Research Institute, and I'm also the founder and director emeritus of the Selected Mutism Association. Hi, everyone. My name is Jenna Blum. I'm a master level clinician. I'm also a fourth year doctoral student. I am the director of Communicamp Counselors at the SMART Center. I'm also the vice president of the Selective Mutism Research Institute. Today, we're gonna to be talking about helping individuals with SM become competent social communicators. So to start with some of the objectives, we're first gonna be discussing some of the common challenges. We're gonna be conceptualizing SM using the social communication bridge. We're gonna give an overview of the social communication anxiety treatment, which is our SCAT treatment. We're gonna talk about the whys of SM, which include the contributing factors into what contributed someone to maintain SM. We're gonna talk about the social communication anxiety inventory, which is our way to assess individuals' level of communication with various settings and with different people. We're gonna actually discuss a case presentation, which we feel is a really good way to kind of tap into um, a holistic approach. And we also think that the goals that we're gonna be giving at the end really do kind of bring everything together. So we're gonna have a treatment focus at the end, which gives specific interventions to become a more confident social communicator. 
So to start with some common challenges, we find that um, there's a lot of social anxiety. So feeling anxious and excessively self-conscious in everyday so social situations. There's also some worries and some fears about other people or about different situations. There could be some insecurity due to missed social communication opportunities. So maybe this could be stemmed from all the way back to childhood where we feel like we didn't put ourselves into certain situations or just now currently in our jobs and in other places. Motivation and seeking help could be challenging. So some of us might not even feel motivated to wanna to seek help. Others feel that we might be motivated, but we don't know which, where to turn, which help to get. There's a lack of social communication confidence. So throughout the years of this learned condition behavior of just feeling this lack of social communication confidence, can I do this? Do I wanna put myself in this situation? There could be some depression, some worsening anxiety from all of the times that maybe when we were younger, building up this social anxiety to now, now it's becoming more conditioned. So we find some more comorbidities. There's some friendship and relationship challenges. So really just our social interactions in general. There's some academic and career challenges. So where do I turn? Who do I turn to? Um, academically, you know, we're finding that maybe we don't reach our full potential because we can't ask for help or we don't feel as comfortable asking for help. Conversation starters. So how do I go up to someone and initiate something? Maybe I'm able to answer if someone comes up to me, but I wanna be able to go up to someone, which goes into initiating speech. So how, how can I think about ways to initiate? What do I ask them? And then lastly, really elaborating or keeping a conversation going. So even if we feel like there's times where we're comfortable going up to someone, can we keep a conversation going? What are, what are ways that I can kind of progress that? How do we conceptualize SM? Selective mutism is a social communication anxiety disorder where it's way more than just not speaking. So mutism is a symptom. There's contributing factors into why someone might have developed SM and why it's being maintained. As an individual with SM being older than the young children, the factors that might have implement um, were impetus in the beginning may be maintaining it now. Maybe they weren't addressed in the past. It's just become more reinforced, more learned, etc. Communication changes from setting to setting and person to person. You might be comfortable and verbal with somebody in one setting, but then see them in a completely different place and be anxious and maybe more shut down and unable to communicate. The social communication bridge is used to assess an individual's stage of social communication, home, school, work, the real world, et cetera. Giving an overview of the social communication anxiety treatment, our SCAT approach, we find that SCAT is based on treating the whole person, not just the mutism. So similar to what we were just talking about with the bridge, we wanna look at that bridge and really get an understanding of where this individual is placed in the bridge in various settings and with different people. It incorporates several therapeutic approaches. So looking at CBT, we really start to discuss thoughts, feelings, behaviors. We go over the CBT triangle. How do these coexist? We look at cognitive distortion. So really trying to reframe these negative thoughts. There's also a behavioral standpoint of just really having a lot of these exposures. Later, we'll talk about how we really try to incorporate as many exposures as possible. And so this is, this is stemmed from you know, adolescent or adult goals and, and things that we place on ourselves. There's a family system approach. So many of us you know, might still be living at home. We might still have that relationship. We might be finding that parents are having trouble letting go. And so we use a family system approach to really tap into these parental dynamics, how the system functions, and really some psychoeducation on the importance of working together as a family. And lastly, there's an insight-oriented approach and motivational interviewing, which really helps clients to understand their own inner workings and motivation. So what if we aren't motivated? What if we feel like, you know what, this is how I've been and this is what I wanna do. It's the way that we can meet you where you are and really go into this motivational interviewing of being ready to tap into that and then go from there. We also attached um, our research link because we have a lot of research on um, selective mutism. And so really recommend kind of looking into that. And I did actually just present at the SMA conference for the different ages. And so you can really look at how SM contributes differently in all developmental stages. The whys of SM, I'm just gonna go through them. 
Of course, being timid is very common where the majority of individuals have social anxiety. We see 30 to 40% of individuals with speech and language issues. Even if you developmentally didn't have a delay, if you have gone years without the give and take of communication, you're gonna actually have an acquired speech and language, specifically in the area of expressive speech. As we said, quiet one or two words, not initiative, not elaborative. So you almost can meet that criteria. We have quite a few individuals and adults as well who have sensory processing challenges. They're very sensory sensitive. So loud, large, lots of people environments can really overwhelm them. Feelings of materials, sights, sounds, picky eating, they, that's all part of it. And of course, some developmental or neurodevelopmental challenges, even individuals with ASD can have selective mutism. Being bilingual, um, learning a language, knowing a language, and then when you're in a situation where another language or culture is expected, you can become anxious. That behavior can be very learned. So although it might've been an effect early on, it's still kind of maintained by your avoidance early on. Learning difficulties, the most common being processing delays, processing issues. We work with adults that'll say, yeah, you know, when I was younger, I needed accommodations for processing. Increase expectation when others are putting pressure on us to speak or having an expectation that we're not capable of doing, that causes more anxiety. Decrease expectation, that's when others get used to who we are and what we do and how we communicate or don't, and they speak for us and do for us. So with the opportunities are just not there. Conditioned and learned behavior, obviously the older you get, the more difficult it is. And so ra rather than feeling scared or afraid, it's hard to do because you're just used to being this way. Speech phobia is when you're stuck against the nonverbal wall on the social communication bridge and you're almost like a professional mime. You wanna speak, but you're just stuck and you can't. This is the social communication anxiety inventory. I'm just giving you an overview here. We're gonna go into more specifics in a case that we discuss, but you can see that the stages of social communication on the bridge, and I'm gonna go right back to this in a sec, right? I think we needed to talk about the bridge right here is the different stages on the bridge. Zero, stage zero is non-communicative. When you aren't responding, when you aren't initiating, you're either shut down or you're talking to somebody else. Stage one, a nonverbal writing, nodding. I mean, that's pretty much most individuals, right? Given time and comfort. The transitional stage for adults or older individuals isn't as powerful um, because you either, either speak or you're not speaking. However, it doesn't mean it's elaborate speech, stage three. It could be quiet one or two words, not initiative and not elaborative. But stage two comes into play primarily with older individuals with SM when somebody's helping bring them into communication and maybe perhaps they become a verbal intermediary. So as we go back into the sky here, this is what this is. This is an inventory that I developed to help kind of track where individuals are in terms of their baseline at home, if they're in college, at work, store, restaurants, virtual situations. And we kind of start with their baseline and then we work towards strategies and interventions to help them progress. So at this point, we're gonna walk through a case. Um, we obviously understand that everyone's different. We do look at the whole person. So we thought that it would be helpful to look through a case but as you're kind of listening to this, maybe think about, you know, do I relate to this? Does someone I know relate to this? And we'll talk about at the end, really these general concepts that really do help throughout. So in this case, just some identifying information, Samantha identifies as a 27 year old Caucasian cisgender heterosexual female. She experiences social anxiety. She's an only child and she lives with her mother and father in Philadelphia. She has a part-time job working virtually for a graphic design studio. So her presenting concern. So Samantha is actually voluntarily seeking treatment to do extreme levels of anxiety and depression. These are some of her symptoms, but this is not just limited. Excessive worry and fear of social situations. So going into work. Um, she did transfer over virtually when she became, when COVID kind of occurred, but really she started explaining how now she's having this fear of going into work now that her boss has told her that they're probably going to be going in in the next few weeks. There's an avoidance and minimal communication outside the home. So even though she does place herself outside of there, there's very minimal ways for her to engage. She just kind of stands behind mom. There's uncertainty in her relationships. 
She has low confidence, low self-esteem, loneliness. She feels isolated. So again, a lot of these symptoms you can find that as we get older, we start to see a lot of comorbidities. So a lot of these symptoms also are kind of emerging into some depression as well. And so these are definitely ways that we want to kind of make sure that we're looking conceptually as a whole and really make sure that we're, we're grasping all of that. Some of the history of her presenting concerns. So Samantha has experienced social anxiety throughout her entire life, but this is the first time that she's experiencing social isolation and extreme loneliness. Growing up, she did have one close friend, but she doesn't see her often due to her friend moving away for after college. Samantha went to a local community college because she had trouble separating from her mother and felt this was the most comfort for her. She has a very close relationship with her parents, but she feels very dependent and resentful for that, especially her mom. Samantha desires higher education and a more challenging career, but she doesn't have the confidence to do so. So right now she expressed that she feels very stuck. During our session, she presented for a telehealth consultation because although she was in Pennsylvania, she was about six, seven hours away. And um, when in engaging with Samantha, her mother was present. When I began to ask questions, Samantha would turn to her mother, who would then answer all of her questions. I then asked Samantha some direct and choice questions, pretty easy questions, things that she really didn't need to think hard about, about the name of her, where she works and things like that. I had to instruct mom not to answer because Samantha would just turn to her mom. When I, when I did that in a kind of a gentle way, Samantha quietly responded after some hesitation. So I allowed her time. So she progressed to stage 3A. Had she not answered, I would have prompted the verbal intermediary by bridging down and perhaps giving a choice for something and prompting mom, her to maybe turn to her mom as a safety because she's not able to verbalize, I'm utilizing the bridge or stage two. We're obviously not going to stay there if that were the case, but it's a step in the process. Interestingly enough, Samantha was more verbal when she was not with her mother. And we see this often with older individuals with SM that they are more verbal and more engaging when the person that they're with the most, especially if it's a parent, is not there with them. Since she was doing well with verbal responding, I bridged up to more open-ended thought-provoking questions. I had to allow her time to respond. Some questions were a little more difficult in terms of just putting her thoughts together. Her anxiety was present. So the right read or script approach was used. So I prompted her to write it down and then read it and she did that easily. Verbal initiation did not occur, non-verbally or verbally. However, when I started to talk to her about asking questions to me, things she might wanna know about me, she got a little nervous and I said, why don't you write the question down? And she clearly did that and she progressed to stage 3B through scripting. Her motivation for change was 10 out of 10, which is awesome. She was a bit apprehensive because she didn't know what that meant and past treatments failed. So she progressed into stage 3A and 3B and she felt really good about herself. In Samantha's case, she's timid. She's very sensitive, loud, large, lots of people environments bother her. She's a very picky eater. She gets overwhelmed in situations where there's just a lot of noise, a lot of lights. She gets very overwhelmed. Her behavior is very conditioned. She's very dependent as well. So she kind of doesn't know how to be any way, any other way. She feels an increased expectation still, although at the same time, she feels others don't give her a chance to engage or communicate and everyone speaks for her. And there's times that she expressed that she wants to speak, she knows she can, but before she could get the words out, other people are speaking for her. So here's her sky. Very simply, what we do is we track her highest stage of communication. For Samantha, she's verbal at home. She's verbal and initiative with her parents, although much less verbal with her father. She also feels her father doesn't understand her as well. Home with friends, that doesn't occur right now. Years ago it did and she was verbal. With relatives, she's either not communicating, relying on her parent, or she's verbally responsive. For the majority of relatives, she's quiet one or two words and she's not initiative. And you can see that outside the home, she hangs with her mom and relies heavily on her communication. At work, she's, vir she's virtual, so she can communicate with ease through the um, email and through the chat box. Initiation is difficult when she wants to get her needs met and to make a point like wanting to do more at work or maybe even asking for a raise. In small groups, she can sometimes answer, especially when she thinks about it ahead of time. In large groups, there are none. 
In public settings, she relies completely on her parents. She doesn't give her orders. She doesn't tell a hostess how many people are in the party. She doesn't ask for a refill for her drink. She can't ask for what she needs. She's completely dependent on her parent and either doesn't go out, which is happening more and more, or she relies and turns to her parent. So going into some of her goals for treatment, she wants to gain independence and move into her own apartment. She knows that she finally wants to get out, but it's been really difficult for her to do so. She wants to seek a romantic relationship and she also wants to make new friends and go out socially. She wants to feel more comfortable in these social situations. And she also wants to be able to speak up to her boss to ask more for work and to receive a raise. She wants to engage in conversation with her extended family. So as of now, she's having some trouble, especially with her uncle and her grandfather. And she wants to respond and initiate to store clerks and waiters in the real world. So starting goal work, and now we're gonna kind of move towards more generally. So of course, this is gonna be applying to Samantha, but this also applies to everyone else that we work with as well, for the most part. Um, so really the first key is just understanding an individual's motivation. So the first time someone walks in, looking at them and saying, okay, how motivated are we? A lot of times we like to use a number system. So we use it from zero to 10 and we'll say 10 being the most motivated to zero being the least motivated because we wanna get an understanding of if, do you wanna be here? Do you wanna seek help? And how much do we feel like these goals are gonna to have to be altered? We discuss feelings charts. So we use a number system as well from zero to five. So zero being, this is the easiest for me and five being, this is the hardest for me. And obviously one, two, three, and four in between, we try to use this to really start to incorporate when we're in, in different settings. So if we're at restaurants, if we're at stores, you know, how did that feel for us? Oh, well, you know, when a store clerk came, store clerk came up to me, it felt like a five, but actually when the waiter came up to me last night, it felt like a four. So we're really starting to understand how we feel in different situations. We wanna pay attention to comorbidities. So like I said, especially as we get into adulthood, there's a lot of comorb comorbidities that are occurring. And this is where it's really important to tap into those whys of SM. We wanna look at the dynamics between parents and adult children. So yes, we're adults, but how much are our parents playing a role? In Samantha's case, she's still living at home with her mom and dad. And she expressed that she's very resentful for that, but at the same time, very dependent on mom. So how does this impact our progress? How does mom act in session? How does dad act in session? We wanna really grab that whole idea and we wanna tap into those family dynamics. We wanna ask, what are your personal and professional goals? So really outline them. Let's grab a journal and write them down. Let's tap into these internal motivations and let's also talk about your passions. What do you wanna do versus what can't, can you do versus right now, what can't you do? We wanna write and plan these goals with, with our guidance as well. We also wanna talk a lot about hobbies and interests. So what do we like to do? Where do we like to go? What, what, what do we foresee in the future? Lastly, we really wanna talk about cognitive restructuring. So this is where CBT is really crucial to really get into those thoughts, feelings, and behaviors. So this is where we see a lot of these self-defeating and maladaptive thoughts like, oh, I can't do this. And so in this case, we really wanna start reframing that and talking about, well, what can you do? So we can flip that. We wanna meet um, the individual at their stage of communication. So as we're in engaging with them, providing psychoeducation, talking with them, if they're most comfortable writing, like let's say if it's virtual, we do a lot of telehealth with people all over the place um, and using a chat box in the beginning is very powerful. However, as we said with Samantha and many of the adults or older teens that we work with, they can speak. So if they go down to nonverbal, sometimes we'll let them know because it's very cognitive that you are able to use your words. Maybe why don't you write that down and read it? So this psychoeducation is very important, but also respecting their stage on the bridge. We talk about how comfort precedes communication and progress doesn't take place in a group. We want to avoid large, loud, and lots of people environments to do our goals. We understand you might need to go there, but into these environments, and we're going to need to bridge down. Individual and parent partner, that's a lot of psychoeducation there. 
parents of uh, teens, adults that we work with need to change their behaviors. And then as we are talking about kind of tap into what is their role in kind of perpetuating these behaviors? What are their fears? What are their worries? What is their identity? Many of these parents um, of individuals with SM, that's their identity. I'm a parent of an adult or a teen with SM. That's who I am. I don't know who I am without that role. So individuals in, the, um, in their lives need to be part of this process. Also, we need to train them to step back, kind of give you opportunities to engage and communicate. On the bridge, we talked about going, like basically engaging strategies such as handing and taking to start communicating. So being on the front line when you go out where you are in front of your parent or your partner, you are handing and taking, you are doing that. What that's doing is it's stimulating engagement. It's welcoming questions from others. It's helping you begin the communication process because for so many individuals, you've been shadowing for many, many years. And for many of the individuals we work with with SM, they actually stop going out. They become much more reclusive. We can't emphasize exposures enough. If you don't go out, if you don't do it, it's just not going to work. It doesn't matter what clinician you see or how much expertise they have. If you're not going to get exposures and work with your clinician on accomplishing that, success is going to be very minimal. Reviewing weekly and monthly availability to do exposures. As we said, it's you're very used to not going out and doing. So individuals with SM really need to dig deep down and when can I do these exposures? Where can I do these exposures? And it often takes looking at your calendar and making a plan. Can't emphasize enough the importance of charted goals. What we see missing with a lot of individuals that we see, and this is really common that we do see individuals from different areas of the country and the world, and they've had failed treatment. So sometimes they'll come to us and be like, nothing's work, what do I do? And what we find is that although some of the goals were appropriate, they weren't charting. There was very little accountability and understanding. So charting is a very CBT based of understanding what it feels like and rating and grading your feeling. And we can't emphasize enough. And we do help provide those charts and help with the charting. Respecting your stage on the bridge. If you're only comfortable handing and taking, that's where you start. If you're more comfortable where the parent or a partner asks a choice to bring you in, that's okay too. You have to respect where you are in the bridge. Too many individuals we work with have this expectation that they need to be verbal and engaging right away. And it's okay to go out and about with a comfy person. Increasing socialization and friendships is often the, one of the biggest goals that we see with individuals with SM. So right away, we write down a list of interests. And for many, it's like, well, I don't know. I don't like anything anymore. When we really dig deep down, there are things either they've liked in the past or they'd like to do, but they've kind of lost hope in doing them. What do you like to do? Like, what would you do if all the anxiety was gone? And we need to think through if there's anyone that you can have connections with to do some of these likes. The picture I put on the left side is actually a real picture. It was a 27-year-old male that I worked with, and he loved rock climbing. He was in graduate school and doing a job across country from his family. He loved that. So the goal was to go and to do rock climbing individually without knowing anyone. As he began to do that, he put a note on the wall in his college about if anyone wanted to do rock climbing. Turns out there were two young men that also wanted to do rock climbing and one young girl, young one woman. So he put a time that they could meet. He did this all through nonverbal communication. They met at the rock climbing place and they started to meet once a week. And before you know it, they're having meals afterwards, meeting out on a Saturday night and they're getting comfortable. For many of the individuals we work with, just getting comfortable is all it often takes. And then we worked in therapy about conversation starters, expanding conversations and initiating speech. And before you know it, they were planning a trip across country, believe it or not, which made me crazy because they were going rock climbing on these really high rocks <laughs> in Colorado. And I was incredibly nervous, but they had an amazing time. And to this day, they're still friends. Pre-planning, -pre again, can't be emphasized enough. Why do we need to pre-plan? Well, first of all, what happens when we're anxious? We can't think, we can't process, we get, and we shut down. By preparing, we're minimizing our need to think and process. We can't forget greetings. There's the big five words. And I always say, if you know these five words, you can get through life pretty easily <laughs> just by waving or nodding, right? But our goal is to progress into speech. Hi, bye, yes, no, and thanks. So we will incorporate the big five words 
into our treatment plan. For example, when someone comes up to you and says, hi, what do you say back? It sounds like it's common sense, but I can't tell you how many individuals, including Samantha in this case, she relied on her parent and just stood there. So working on these big five words in a very structured kind of planning it out way, it's not as hard as people think to be able to greet people. And instead of nodding for yes or no, and I have a goal called no, no to nod. So even in session, I'm like, oh, no, no to nods. And they'll be like, yes. And then it becomes something we kind of joke about. The script approach, write and read or write and show. Again, many individuals we work with can speak. If they can, the script approach of pre-planning helps minimize the need to think and process. We will use that in various aspects of their life going out into stores, into public in all different ways. Responding by finishing the sentence is a very common strategy that we use to help individuals become more confident in their social communication. That's relying on a parent or a partner to start a sentence where they finish it. And it could just be a choice. And we do that with all ages based on the individual's developmental age will dictate how they set this script up. In this case, with most individuals with SM, we're writing and using words. Initiating, most individuals we work with cannot initiate. It's incredibly difficult, at least verbally. So we will have to script out, even looking for things in a store. Hi, do you have blank? Thank you. That simple script that's written out in the beginning becomes memorized and they don't have to write it down. So write and read is very important. Write and show is mentioned there, but we don't try to perpetuate nonverbal. We will use individuals in their lives to help bridge them into communication if possible. But there are individuals we work with that if they just show their menu item, that's what they do in the beginning as a comfort. But most individuals we work with don't wanna feel self-conscious, they don't want to be. So using their words or having someone bridge them in using choices and scripts is often the way they go. 100 times in 10 days and planning it out is very important. You may not get 100 times in 10 days, we get that, but it's a goal. And you can get a 10 times in one CVS outing. What times and days using your calendar to help you know when you're gonna go because we are so used to not going out that by having it planned out on the calendar helps most individuals. So common questions, this is kind of like the next step. So why do we do common questions? Common questions really minimize our time to think and process. We script them out, right? So we don't have to think about it. Visuals are key. So if we have these questions, like if you look to the right here, this, this individual, it was a college student. Um, he actually took a gap year. He ended up writing down all these questions that he thinks people might have asked him when he goes back to school. So it minimizes not only your time to think and process, but it provides you with a visual, which is important. It's like right now we're we're using a visual, right? We're using a PowerPoint. And without that, we might not we might not be able to think about all the strategies right off the top of our minds. So common questions are really helpful. We want to think about what questions can people ask in different settings. So really breaking it down, like what do you think familiar individuals might ask you? Like if you go to a family event, what do you think people might ask you in stores, in restaurants? What would waiters do when they come up to you? What if you need to ask a store clerk a question? Can we write that down? What about at a family gathering? So with a larger group? And also what about at work? What do you think your boss might ask you? What if it's your monthly check-in? What kind of questions does your boss usually ask you? So again, charting is really key. And we do have an example of a chart on the next slide. So this is an example of a chart that we provide sometimes. Um, so this is really breaking it down. In this chart, we used a restaurant. So again, we wanna think about different places. So in this chart, we really broke everything down. So if, it's hard to see, but we wrote down, you know, if the hostess says hi to you, what do you say? If the hostess asks how many people are in your group, what would you say? And so on, if you wanna drink, if you want to eat, so on. So we're really trying to make sure that we're incorporating everything and we're pre-planning and we're writing it and scripting. All right, so action plans. So this kind of pulls everything together. This pulls the greetings, the common questions, everything in once. So action plans, um, you know, really allow you to plan out different events with different people. So really thinking, what is this event, right? What, who's gonna be at this event? So let's say we're thinking about you know, um, going back to college, right? So we're thinking about going back to college and, you know, we want to write down who's going to be there. Okay, well, my sweet mates, 
my teachers are gonna be there, different people that I see in the dining hall. We list out every single person. What questions do you think these different people might ask you? Oh, well, how was your summer? What did you do this summer? Did you go on vacation this summer? Right, so you're constantly running down every question and you wanna also write down your answers to these questions because similar to the common questions, you wanna make sure that you're prepared. And then lastly, you wanna ask about what questions could you ask someone? So we're working on both the responding piece and the initiating piece. So we wanted to add this slide in here really because it's so crucial to find your people. Um, and we believe that you can find your people through areas of interest, like what we've been talking about before. So you're gonna find them doing things like going to an animal shelter if you like animals, maybe planting if you feel like that's something that you wanna do. So really practicing these skills with these people are crucial because these are gonna be people that also you implement these action plans with. What do you think these people might ask you when you go to these events? What can you ask them? We also wanna think about um, in terms of action plans, just to kind of um, elaborate on that as well, is that when you're going out in public, you know, when you have your action plan, you've planned it out with your therapist, you're working through it. And one of the goals that we have with action plans is when you're thinking about going out, write out your plan, like for example, to a store, to a restaurant, who's gonna be there, what could they ask? You're practicing that in therapy and you're working through it. It doesn't mean we're carrying the action plan with us, although we may have write and read, for example, or looking at a menu and seeing it that way or in a grocery store when we're approaching store clerks. One thing we've learned, even with action plans, even with learning common questions, we have to respect where somebody is on the bridge, but we also have to look around. We have to listen and we have to learn from others. We find that many individuals with SM have missed a lot of opportunities. Either they haven't gone out because of their anxiety, others are doing for them. And when someone's doing for you, speaking for you, engaging for you, and you're kind of just hanging out, you're not thinking through the process, you're just going through the motions. And many of the individuals we work with Things as simple as just going into a store and thinking about what I might need and what if I can't find it? Or what if I need a refill on my drink? Or what if I have to ask a question to my professor? Like look around, listen to how others in, talk to each other, um, learn from that. And that's really important. Journal those encounters and observations. And that's something in therapy that we talk through. And you might notice things that you never noticed before that we can begin to implement more into your treatment. Record it well and think about it. The grocery line is a wonderful opportunity at family gatherings and even work meetings. How are colleagues talking to each other? What are they saying? What are they laughing at? At a grocery line, what is the store cashier saying to the, per to the person in front of you? What's the person in front of you saying? Greetings, hi, bye, thank you, have a great day. Just pay attention to that. And that again, it's going to make, it's almost like you're in treatment in these settings as you're watching all of this. And did you have any communication and interaction? What did you learn that day that maybe you, you were able to implement? The pre-planning again is mentioned here because about pre-planning when you're going out and about is important. What happens when we're anxious is that little tiny um, almond shaped amygdala in our brain is set off and that causes shutdown and anxiety. If we can think ahead of what questions could be asked, who's going to be there and so forth, we're actually bypassing it because we're on the lookout for common questions. We're on the lookout for what questions could be asked. Many times individuals will say, well, I don't know what to say back if someone says something to me. So copy back is a great approach that really just taps into, you know, say whatever they said back to you, right? It's easy as that. So if someone says to you, how are you? Copy them back, say, good, how are you? So we teach this, especially in the beginning when we're starting to get comfortable, just respond, responding to individuals or even initiating. But we start this as a way to really have this easy approach to just copy back what they say. You know, what did you do this weekend? Not that much, what did you do this weekend? So really mirroring that. And we find that a lot of times that adds a lot more comfort into their communication. We also wanna do expanders. So once we're at this point where maybe we're a little bit further along with copy back and now we wanna add more of this give and take. You know, I wanna start initiating or I wanna start adding context other than just saying, good, how are you? So we add something called an I am statement or an I just statement. I am is a statement that's happening in the future and I just is something that just happened in the past, right? 
So you want to expand your thoughts by adding a detail. So instead of saying, good, how are you? Could we say, good, I'm spending the weekend with my family. How are you? So we're adding a little bit more content. And a lot of times these individuals find that it's helpful because it makes the conversations a lot more fluid and natural. Plan it and do it. Focus on areas of high interest and go. Really plan it out. It's about accountability and frequency. We talked about 100 times in 10 days to do exposures. If you say, I cannot do it between work and my everyday life, I'm going to have a goal of 25 times. We will work with you on that. In other words, that's okay. In the journal to the right, you can see that this, um, this was a young adult who wrote out the, go the location that he was in. And um, well, we can say, I think this was um, all different exposures. Some will have a specific page or journal for, let's say, restaurants or stores or outings with individuals. And in this particular case, going to the boating store and having a goal of saying goodbye or hi, or maybe for this individual, they needed to wave. Maybe they were nonverbal. So engaging through waving or, or um, you know, hello or goodbye or nodding for thank you might be a way to start. If they're bringing their partner, it might be they're brought in through communication through the verbal intermediary. So you can see to the right that it's before I did the goal, I thought I was going to feel a 4.5 out of um, five. And then you can see that it changes to much easier if I had to do that goal again. And this is a very CBT based approach because this helps you realize that things get easier or they stay the same. And that kind of cognitive awareness and reshaping your thoughts to, I'll never be able to do it to, yes, let's place goals. Let's do goals in places we can accomplish it. So again, these goals are realistic goals that the therapist should plan with you based on your comfort, your stage on the bridge and accommodating any comorbidities you have like speech and language or processing difficulties. We want to really think about the activities and hobbies. We can't forget those. We need to really think about going out and planning. We've sit in session with Samantha, for example, and she was very interested in doing working at a animal shelter. So what we did is we went and we Googled animal shelter near me and we looked and we worked on that. And she actually, we worked with her on reaching out to someone that she knew that she hadn't connected with in the past and they began going. And then she met two other friends that way. So it's really important that journaling this and paying attention to your activities and hobbies because over time we end up not going and doing and the accountability is important. Implementation is critical. In the research on SCAT, it showed if the goals and strategies are not implemented, it does not work. So going to your therapist and sitting there every week and talking about your anxieties, wor your worries, your fears, it's great, of course. And that's where a lot of CBT is used and restructuring your difficult you know, your negative thoughts and talking through difficult situations, but it's really about your exposures and your implementing your goals that really makes the difference in your life. And as I said, 98 out of 100 times, things get easier or stay the same. I'd like to say 100 times out of 100 times, things get easier or stay the same, but most people don't believe me. So I say 98 out of 100, of 100 times. When goals don't work, what does that mean? Well, we wanna ask ourselves these questions. Did you respect the stage on the bridge? Did you push yourself too hard? So you and your therapist were working on, let's say going out with your, in Samantha's case with her mother. She's very motivated for help. She resents her mother in a lot of ways but she needed her mother to start this process. So her mother was the one that went up to the store clerk with Samantha next to her and said, excuse me, sir, can you help us? Samantha, I can't remember. Are we looking for, what are we looking for? We're looking for this, or are we looking for that? And brought her into conversation that way. In Samantha's case, just even just showing a note was what she worked on. She felt a little uncomfortable, but we talked about the fact that she wasn't even engaging or communicating in that setting. So she felt safe going somewhere where she didn't know anyone or could run into anyone. And that's where we did the goal. And as she started to do that, she realized showing that note was only like it was a zero. That was easy. And then we progressed into answering one word. And she's like, that was easy too. And so what she realized was there was a lot of missed opportunities. And so as we're implementing these goals and we're creating the opportunities, 
Individuals can do a lot more than they think, but they still need to respect the stage on the bridge that's set up with your therapist. Did you rate your feelings before you did the goal? Was it a 10 out of five, meaning it was impossible, but you pushed yourself and then you felt like a failure because you didn't do it? Or was an easier goal picked that you could accomplish to then bridge into a more difficult goal? So did you rate your feelings before you did your goal? Was the environment really loud? Many individuals we work with, they get very overwhelmed with loud, large, lots of people environments in the sense of they're interacting and they're engaging. Interestingly enough, the louder, the larger, the more people, the more individuals will kind of, I call it shrink down. So they'll shrink down into themselves rather than come out and be more engaging or more outward, more verbal or more or louder. So the louder, the larger, the more people, we have to respect that it's gonna take us a little more time to warm up. We might hesitate with our response. So, go, and we may need to bridge down. So again, was the environment loud? Were there a lot of people? Was it really crowded? Did you see someone you knew and that shut you down? We find that individuals with SM will feel like, wait a minute, I know that guy, he was in, he works with me and they'll shut down because they don't want, they don't feel comfortable seeing people that they know. Was it a super large environment where they were too busy processing the environment and what people were doing and they couldn't think straight as somebody said to me recently. So doing things in smaller, less crowded, quieter environments to do your goals is a suggestion because from there, of course, you're going to be in some of these 3L environments, loud, large, lots of people environments, but doing your goals in not those environments are what we recommend. Did you sense a high expectation from someone? In Samantha's case, she doesn't feel the high expectation from mom. In fact, it's the opposite. Mom does for her and speaks for her because she implies to Samantha that she can't do those goals. So she makes her almost feel like, I know that's hard for you, I'll do it for you. And that has perpetuated over time. And she sees herself as someone that can't. So although with the opportunity, Samantha made incredible progress very quickly, she actually needed to have more expectation from her mom rather than less. Whereas with dad, she feels incredible expectation from dad. Dad gets very frustrated with her, doesn't understand why she doesn't have a better job. Although for Samantha, she'd like to pursue her education. She's actually happy in her job. She just would like to do a little bit more, but she likes what she does. She feels a lot of discontent with her dad. And as a result, she's not as connected with her dad. She spends less time with her dad. When her dad asks questions, she answers him, but very, very minimally. So she actually avoids times with her dad because of that expectation. So if dad is gonna go out with her to the grocery store, Samantha is not gonna feel as successful to do these goals. So she may pull back. Did you feel overwhelmed by something just off a work call? You literally were stressed by a work call. There was a lot going on. There's a lot of changes being made, but you were really needed to get something at the store and you had to go out. And this was part of your goals. Were you overwhelmed prior? Did you feel really anxious prior? That's not an ideal time to do your goals. You wanna go at a time that you feel at peace. And of course, doing meditation and other relaxation techniques will also help in times where you feel very anxious. Did you not plan it out well? Did you feel, again, you went in, you didn't plan, you didn't script it, you didn't do an action plan, you, didn't, you weren't prepared. And therefore, when people asked you questions, you became very overwhelmed and you shut down. So we have to think about that. 15 minutes left. Yep. We want to flip things to a positive. There's an art to connecting to a therapist. Um, and that's important. You have to have confidence in your clinician. You have to feel safe with your clinician. You need to have paper and pen available if you're, if you're uncomfortable or using a chat box. With your negative thoughts, we want to flip it to a positive rather than always think ne negative. We want to normalize difficulties and struggles and not be so hard on ourselves. Part of the therapeutic process is working and changing that thought process. So yes, you're working on exposure goals. Yes, you're working on it. But when you have a negative thought, flip it to a positive thought. In other words, instead of I can't do this, I can't give my order in a restaurant, I can't do it, I have to have mom do it, I'm not gonna do it at all, let's think about how that can be positive. Yes, you know what, I can do that. I'm gonna write it down and I'm gonna to go to a quieter location and I'm gonna do it. I'm not smart, 
No, I am smart. Here are the things I can do. And so you take these negative thoughts or these difficult situations and we flip it to a positive. And that's very, very important. And we see this all the time, working with individuals to help them see things in a positive, a more positive light. And we need to understand that the therapist is going to help you one step at a time based on your goals. You may be motivated for help like Samantha was, but you need help getting there one step at a time. And you may need to start with maybe goals that are a little easy for you in the beginning, handing, taking, I can do that, no brainer, I can do it. You know what, we've had many individuals with SM let us know that they can do it, but in reality, they couldn't do it and they became overwhelmed. So some of these goals that seem kind of easy or fuel and reinforcement to do more of the other goals because it welcomes others to engage and ask you questions. And guess what? If people don't ask, you won't answer even at any stage in your bridge. So it's crucial to focus on your goals, not other people's goals, but your goals. You need hope and motivation to get through this. And it's going to take that engaging and interaction with others to make this a positive situation. And one last thing I wanna say, that one thing we do work on that we didn't talk a lot about are ways to engage with others in terms of interviews and assignments and asking questions and answering questions. And again, that's something that we work on in therapy that it almost seems as if it's an assignment when you're asking questions to someone, almost like an interview, but you're actually practicing your skills. So I just wanted to mention at the SMART Center, this is all we do every day, all the time. I've been doing this for 20, almost 30 years. And this has been my life's work. And we have telehealth. We offer testing, evaluation, psychoeducation, autism spectrum evaluations. We work with all sorts of mental health issues, other anxieties. We offer individual treatment. We offer group treatment. We, we offer the weekly groups in our communicamp for ages three to 17. We have professional consultations with clinicians, with adults, with SM that aren't necessarily doing treatment with us. We do school-based consultations for those that are still in school. And so we encourage you to look at our resource page on our website, selectingmutismcenter.org. There's a podcast that was done with Out Loud with adults with SM. That's a really um, good podcast I think you might enjoy. And there's a lot of resources on there about ways to educate others um, as well. So we did real well on our time and we wanna be able to take some questions. That was really great. Thank you. I think a lot of people are going to find that helpful. Um, I really enjoyed how you to emphasis on planning things out in preparation. I think that's always a big deal with anxiety work. I think sometimes people don't prepare enough, don't plan out enough. Yeah. And also really um, meeting somebody where they're at. I thought that's a great uh, point because sometimes people have big goals that are that are nice, but sometimes they reach too far at times, and you really need to break things down into into tiny steps. Yeah. I think it did great job emphasizing that. I see we have three questions in the chat box. One was um, in regards to the, the, the client you had about the animal shelter. Um, would you help the client contact the animal shelter ahead of time and prep the people there that, so the client, that the client had difficulties with communication? How, how does that process work? Do you recommend like telling an employer that there are communication issues? So this is a great question, actually. So I really do appreciate it. it. The individual we're working with has to be part of this process. We have individuals with SM that we work with that don't want any help. They get annoyed. Like, I don't want anybody to know about this. I'm going to do this on my own. And so for that individual, no, we need to work with the individual with SM and talk about how are they going to you know, contact that animal shelter? Are they going to write an email? Are they going to try to ask for a one-on-one -on -one meeting first? Then of course, we'll work on the interview questions and things like that with them. Then there's the others that say, listen, I really need help. I don't mind that they know, especially for the individuals with FSM that might need special services and in the workforce moving forward. So yes, prepping the people that, that are there is um, if that individual we're working with wants that, we will work with them absolutely and do that. And we do that often. We'll even do trainings and help them. And this is a great place that interviews come in place of reading questions, knowing the answers in advance. So it is very individualized. We did a, um, a 
a lecture yesterday called SM Through the Ages and how individuals present at different ages based on their developmental and cognitive level and so forth. For younger kids as parents, yeah, they can set this world up. They can talk to the people at the animal shelter. They can, you know, do the whole thing. And the, and the child just kind of goes along with the ride. But as individuals age, we really need to respect their role in this process. And very often, which we talked about with Samantha, that parents are very involved, almost overly involved. And they're the ones making the contacts and doing. And this is where that independence really is important to help them feel independent so that they're taking the role. So often with, I'm gonna use Samantha, but this is hundreds of adults we've worked with that we have to say, hey, to the parent, hey, listen, it's her turn, she needs to do it. And we almost have to downplay it and not make them feel uncomfortable, but really help them step back so that the individual with SM is able to make that connection and we will work with them on that. Yeah, it seems it's important that it's very individualized. It depends on what the person wants. Yeah. Um, there's, yeah, go ahead. Just gonna move on to the next question. Do you have any specific tips for female college freshmen with selective mutism, social anxiety, who's living in a dorm but still struggling socially and making connections? She attended your camp years ago and it helped a great deal. Um, I would say for this one, definitely thinking about common interests, I would feel like would be like the biggest piece here. So like, are there any clubs or activities that she can join that she feels like those are her people? So I think the first step is like really finding those people. Um, you know, it could be, let's say, you know, we love biology, maybe it's a science club, maybe it's an outing club where we go on hikes every week and we can kind of talk with someone there. Um, so really like one, finding those connections, I feel like is important. So maybe writing down those um, high interest topics. And then also I think another step would be like, just like observing around, like look, listen and learn, I feel like is a really big tool too here of just like, what are people asking around you? What conversations are they having? Um, and then being able to kind of start to kind of conceptualize that and then maybe go into those conversations. Um, yeah. And in addition, for, I have quite a few kids that started college this year. And one thing that we did is we asked for singles we didn't have them live with a roommate. We actually made that request and I'm not enabling them, but I have found that because many of our, our individuals that we work with are very sensitive and they don't have always a lot of experience socially, especially if they started with us late in the game. Being with a roommate can be very stressful. Maybe that roommate is super social and has people in the room all the time. It can really cause it, John, you're smiling. So I'm wondering what you're thinking. <laughs> But yeah, so we, I will recommend a single. We've used emotional support animals. I'm all about making this big jump and leap to college comfortable. We also develop accommodations and the individual with SM has to request the accommodations and 504 plan through the university. It cannot be the parent. And again, parents are so used to doing and saying for their child, but it's going to be the individual with SM that has to make that like leap and do it. And that's what we help them with. We will help write those accommodations for the um, individual with SM that's specific to them as far as, um, you know, things as simple as presentations in a large group, allowing them to submit their presentation um, either one-on-one -on -one with the professor or non, you know, through a paper that they submit. So based on the individual's unique needs, we will make absolute specific accommodations that the universities need to use and accommodate them with. So again, they're not specific to everyone. I mean, it's not a general, it's very specific. Um, I hope that answered that question. <laughs> I think that was good over you. Yeah, I was smiling because when I went off to college, I had my own dorm and I actually found that to be very helpful because again, just having that space where I could go back to the living on a camp, big campus, you're with everybody all the time and not having any space to decompress was personally was, was important. And I would say your 90% 90, 90 of the kid, individuals that start a college feel just like you do. And what one parent said to me is, well, if she doesn't have a roommate, how is she going to socialize? Well, that's mm -hmm. where the clubs, the activities are very yeah. important. And we really work closely on finding those clubs and activities and emailing the leader of those activities. And some individuals want those people to know that this is hard for me. I really could use your help. Um, mm -hmm. And, you know, the beginning of college, they do do a lot of connecting with other college students, so that's a plus. But having a roommate can actually, in the beginning, not always benefit them. Also, we've had individuals go to college with 
other friends. And that's not always a positive to room with them either, especially if that individual starts making new friends, it can make the, the individual that, the, you know, the individual with SM feel kind of lost and afraid. Um, is there a connection between SM and high sensory? I really um, want to mention this, that yes, huge, huge. People with sensory processing or just being highly sensitive, which is a large population of individuals with SM, they will shut down and they will not be able to communicate in those environments. So we talked about SM being a social communication anxiety where mutism is what the last, you know, what you see and shut down sometimes. So yes, being a highly sensitive individual and being overwhelmed causes you to shut down. And that's why avoiding loud, large, lots of people environments, tremendous. And we do have research on that on our research site about the connection between sensory processing and the types of sensory processing and selective mutism. But I would say that's the biggest correlation with shutting down as being a highly sensitive individual. Um, yeah. Yeah, I think you also did a out, similar out loud podcast uh, about that when you talked about it, the AST and autism. Oh yeah, absolutely. Um, with SM comorbidity. So I think that's a great discussion if people want to look at that. Next question, can a young adult work on these kinds of goals with their own without a therapist? How do you navigate that or for adults as well? Um, I mean, I definitely think that it's important for young adults to feel you know autonomy and to feel like independent. And if they feel like it's important that they kind of complete this on their own to kind of give them that sense of mastery. I think that's awesome. But at the same time, I do think that it's important to think about the accountability of that aspect. So do I reach these goals? Am I having trouble with those goals? And really that's where, you know, we talk about charting and doing these things to really make sure that we're accountable for them, to really make sure that we're doing these exposures or writing them down. Um, and so I think that a therapist and kind of building that therapeutic alliance and building that relationship is really crucial because I think that's also the first step into having kind of this give and take of a, a normal type of process um, where it's like you're having this connection with someone for the first time where you're practicing this give and take. And so I think utilizing that's important, but I also think that giving them their autonomy is, is crucial too. I also want, you know, whomever asked this question or just the audience in general, that to think about if you've gone so many years and you've probably tried different treatments, you know, it's important that somebody's guiding this process because it's, if you think about a tree, it starts with a trunk, right? Like we gave a lot of generalizations. We put a lot out there based on a typical case that's a lot of similar to a lot of individuals that we see, but it needs to be tweaked, you know, like Samantha might sim seem similar to you, but then we tweaked the process a lot along the way. And I think a therap, I know that a therapist with experience and knowing how to tweak your treatment in between and when you reach the roadblocks is going to be important. So yes, yeah, start it out. But if you're reaching roadblocks, I always say if you go 10 days without making improvements, you need to connect with somebody. And you're talking about people with expertise. So a lot of the experts presenting this weekend, I mean, many of them have been doing it for many, many, many years. That's experience that an individual that's trying to do this on their own just doesn't have. And also the insight that a therapist is gonna to have to you and helping guide you with a lot of, as Jenna was saying clearly, restructuring your kind of negative thoughts and your feelings about things. And that's something that I don't think an individual can do you know, on their own. Mm -hmm. And the next question for, for those in the audience who feel like they have personal trouble like initiating the therapy process or maybe too old where a parent isn't in the right position to help them out or is not around to help them out. How, how do you, you have some advice on how people can get started on this? I think that one thing is that many of these people being adults and having and wanting the help, if they have that if they don't have anybody in specific, like a parent, maybe they have a friend, maybe they have a distant relative that can help them. Maybe they wanna do it on their own and that's gonna be a little harder, but we do it all the time. We've had adults consult with us without anybody else. And I think the assistance of a parent, especially if they're dealing with grief and all of that is gonna be as, you know, obviously an issue they have to deal with in itself. But as an adult, um, navigating this process with the assistance, without the assistance is really relying on that therapist and doing those exposures with the therapist and connecting often, like with weekly psychotherapy. That's important that you don't just try and tackle all this on your own, but your therapist is the person that's guiding you through the process. 
I know we're almost out of time. I just want to mention, how do you help the SM adult afraid to go to a club on their own due to lack of confidence? Um, Jenna, do you want to take that real quick? Because I know that's something you... Yeah, I mean, I think that, you know, thinking about what are helpful tips for me, like in this situation. So could there be a friend that goes with me to the club? Um, could there be a time where maybe I go to this club before the attendance of everyone being there and I could just see what that environment looks like? Could I meet with like the club leader before I go there on my own and just kind of get to know them a little bit? Um, really maybe trying to navigate who's going to be there. So I think one, you know, thinking about like, your level of motivation for this too. Like if this is something you really wanna do, like those are definitely helpful tips for that. Um, and also just really tying into the people in that group. So could I really start to utilize those individuals? Um, I think is really helpful. Yeah, and I think it's starting at home, even virtually and looking for things and building a skill. Some people don't wanna um, join a club until they feel like they have some skills. And often individuals with SM, I see this a lot, if they have a role, like a big shot role, almost like they have a role, they're a leader. I've had many individuals I work with start clubs because they're the leader and they feel good about it. I mean, it's similar, like I'm talking about SM, but if I needed to talk about a topic that I didn't know a lot about, I'd be way more anxious. So I think it's, you know, looking at the individual and what they want to do and really working with them to navigate that situation, to help them not just join a club, but to connect socially um, with others and start finding their people. Thank you both so much for uh, all this great information. I think everyone would be very informative, um, but we have to end now, sorry. And our next presentation is in 10 minutes. So we'll see everybody else there and appreciate it. Thank you very much. Thank you Bye. so much. Thank you, everyone. Bye.